Hello, welcome to the online uh, Sunday morning service of Mountain View Baptist Church in Johnson City, Tennessee. Uh, if you're just joining us today, maybe for the first time visiting with us, my name's Rich Murray and I'm the pastor here at Mountain View and we're so glad and so thankful that you've joined us today. If, uh, if you have and, and you're enjoying the service, we encourage you to go on to our website, www.mtnview baptist.com fill out our uh, connection contact card tell us who you are maybe how we can minister to you and how we could love on you a little bit a uh, few things that i want to announce before we get into our service this morning we are continuing on with our drive-in service uh, that's going on at 10 o'clock uh, on sunday mornings here in our parking lot and so we encourage you, if you have an opportunity, get a chance to come out and join us in person uh, at the drive-in service. Also, we want to encourage you to follow us on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, keep check on our website. Follow us on all those social media uh, places, and, and uh, you will find all kinds of information about us and the things that are going on. Uh, to keep you updated on what's happening here at Mountain View Baptist. I especially want to mention our children and youth programs and departments. Uh, we have a youth pastor, Jacob Newman, and a children's pastor, uh, Josh Edens, and both of those men are doing great jobs of, of staying connected with our children and youth. And if your child or young person is not being connected and not uh, maybe even being fed spiritually, then I encourage you to reach out to us and we'll... Uh, we'd love to have them to come and be a part of what we're doing online. Um, we are also a part of the Holston Baptist Association Online Revival. We're a member of the Holston Baptist Association, and uh, this revival is being, uh, it's actually online, uh, being streamed Monday through Friday at 7 p.m., and a different pastor from one of our Holston Baptist churches is preaching each night. And so uh, you can actually go back and find sermons that have already been preached, and you can tune in as they premiere each night at 7 o'clock, Monday through Friday. We don't know when this is going to end. We've still got preachers that are signing up, and we encourage you to, uh, to tune in as God's really speaking through these men. And uh, the last thing I want to share with you is that as things are beginning to loosen up, as we're trying to open up our society a little bit, and as government is, has uh, relaxed some of the restrictions, we have a plan in place. Uh, on May the 31st, we're going to begin phase one of our reopening and meeting back inside as a church. We have an 8.30 early service that we've had for several years now. And uh, on the 31st, we will have that service, uh, and that alone will be the inside service. Uh, we are continuing on at 10 o'clock with our drive-in service. Now, at this time, we're not going to do any in-person uh, Sunday school or small group meetings. We're working on all that and trying to improve it all the time uh, in our online presence. But uh, just pin that date down. Uh, May the 31st, as we meet inside, uh, our plans are to meet inside for the first time uh, since back in March. Well, we've uh, got a lot going on, but we want to take time to worship the Lord. And so whether you're at home, whether you're driving down the road or at your place of work, wherever you are, if you're watching this, we want to, uh, we want to get into a frame of worship. We want to, we want to get... Uh, to a place where, where the Lord can speak to us. And so uh, once I pray, we're going to uh, have some songs uh, led by Miss Kelly Davenport, uh, who is our worship leader here. And she's going to be accompanied by Janet Jennings and Kevin Luckadoo. And uh, we are thankful for them. And so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's worship him today. Father, we thank you and we praise your holy name for the uh, ability to gather online. And uh, Father, we know that your Holy Spirit uh, transcends time and space, and so we ask that wherever we are, even though we're separated physically, I pray that you would unite us spiritually, that you would speak 
through the songs that are sung that you would speak through the sermon that is preached I pray Father that your Holy Spirit would have control and that you would comfort and convict and do the work that you do so well and Lord we just thank you for allowing us to be here gathered in this unique way it's in Jesus precious and holy name we pray amen to sing with us
slows down and covers me. It covers me. great job. Thank you all so very much. Um, they do such a great job. And I, I, listen, they, they don't ever want to be recognized, but I just sometimes don't even mention them because they don't want to be. But I just can't say enough about uh, Mike Crumley and Jerry Witt, our tech guys that make sure that this happens uh, week in and week out. And, and they've put in a lot of extra time and a lot of extra effort without one complaint and uh, I just I just appreciate them uh, so very much well if you've tuned in before you know that we just finished up a series uh, out of the book of Isaiah of course last uh, Sunday was Mother's Day and we talked a little bit about mothers but uh, uh, we are starting a new series um, that I have entitled Joy in the Journey. There's a, a lot of uh, titles I thought about went through my head, but it's a sermon series based out of, uh, or actually directly, verse by verse, out of the book of Philippians. And um, I, God just really laid that on my heart, uh, this this sermon series, because when Paul wrote... Philippians, he was in quarantine. He was under house arrest. And uh, so uh, he was, in a way, a lot like we are uh, in this COVID-19 or in a lot like we have been uh, during this coronavirus. And yet, through it all, he did some amazing, amazing ministry. And so uh, I just believe God laid it on my heart um, that uh, while Paul was under quarantine, he did the work of the Lord, and and uh, he God just laid this on my heart, and I believe this is where we're to be preaching from for the next several uh, weeks, and and dare say it'll run into months. But uh, let me give you a little bit of introduction as we continue on through this series. You will learn a little bit about uh, the church at Philippi and about Philippi itself, but let me give you just a, a brief introduction to it. Uh, Philippi is, uh, of course, it was named after uh, the Roman leader uh, Philip, and it is where Octavian and Mark Anthony defeated Brutus and Cassius when the Roman Republic became the Roman Empire. And uh, so it was a place for, where a critical battle was fought, and uh, as such, a lot of veterans from the Roman uh, military uh, actually actually lived there and stayed there. And it was a very Roman town, and it was very important to the providence of Macedonia. And you can find quite a bit of the history, at least of the church, over in Acts chapter 16. And I won't, I won't read it for you, but uh, if you get a chance, turn over and read some of that. I think you'll be... Um, It'll help you to understand uh, maybe what had happened. But this church at Philippi was the very first church in Europe. Now, I want to tell you, if you're an English-speaking person uh, listening to me today, uh, of course, if you can't speak English, you probably wouldn't be listening. But if you're an English-speaking person, then you have a great amount of gratitude uh, for that church at Philippi, with them being the first European uh, church, and that's where the gospel was first uh, shared there. 
And it, it was started there because God had sent a vision to Paul. Now, Paul had already had other plans. He wanted to share in Asia. Now, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. I, I just find it interesting that uh, I imagine he may have even prayed and maybe even felt compelled to go to Asia. But it says that the Spirit of Jesus shut him down from sharing the word in Asia. And he wanted to go to a place called Bithynia, and, and God wouldn't allow him to. But in a vision, um, Paul saw a man asking for help over in Macedonia, pleading with him, come, come and help us, come and share with us. And uh, I was just reminded by this that uh, and, and <laughs> if we've ever uh, been reminded of anything through this virus, is that our plans are oftentimes futile. So many times we as people, we as churches, as organizations, we're worried so much about planning out our next 10 years that we forget to plan about the next 10 days. And so Paul's plans were shut down. What he thought, uh, maybe even thought that God was leading him to do, God changed the plans at the last moment. And so even though your plans for what 2020 ought to look like, for what 2020 ought to be like, uh, you had a certain mindset, a certain vision. Maybe you've, uh, you're have here and you're watching and you had plans for a graduation or, or maybe you'd had plans for a big Mother's Day uh, feast and, and a get-together. Maybe you'd had plans for a family trip or maybe you had, uh, who knows what kind of plans you may have had, but God uh, has reminded us that he is in control and our plans only work under his timeline. And so Paul goes over uh, to uh, Macedonia where Philippi is a very important, a key city in it. We're actually told that in Acts chapter 16. And there he planted a church and he planted that church through evangelism. He won lost people to the Lord. I, I just... Uh, God just, as I was preparing this sermon, has reminded me that so often, and, and through this revival as we're, uh, the Holston Baptist revival, as we're uh, working with other pastors, you know, so many times we look to grow our churches by trading sheep. That's not what God's called us to do. He's called us to win sheep, to win the lost. Evangelism is how we ought to be growing our churches, not hoping that somebody leaves one church and comes to ours, but rather instead that we see lost souls saved and that we, if we're not out evangelizing, we're not going to see the kind of growth that God intends. But Paul evangelized some people. He evangelized Lydia. Lydia, the Bible tells us, was from Thyatira. It means she was uh, from the Asia. Uh, she was an Asian uh, person, uh, that was where, where she was from. And she was a seller of purple, which means she was likely a wealthy, a wealthy woman. And uh, uh, Paul had, had actually gone over to Philippi, and there wasn't a synagogue. And so even though on the Sabbath day he looked for a, a synagogue, he couldn't find one. So he actually went out by the river and found a women's prayer group. And there it said that, Lydia, uh, she, she was a person that was devoted to the Lord, but she didn't know the entire gospel. And she heard the gospel and she was saved. And so we see that take place. We later see Paul, uh, a slave girl who was possessed by a demon. And that, that demon allowed her to foretell the future. And, and she, her owners were using her to raise money. And uh, she followed Paul around for days. And finally he, he turned around, cast the demon out of her. And from what we can tell, she became a Christian. She became a follower. But this would end up costing him as he was thrown in prison for causing a ruckus. And so while he was in prison, uh, he was there uh, likely with Timothy. And uh, they were singing hymns and praising the Lord. And uh, earthquake came. Prison guard thought that they were gone. And, and uh, lo and behold, uh, they had already beaten uh, Paul. 
And uh, Paul shared the gospel with the prison guard, and he and his entire family was, was saved. And so uh, from these three people, we see the beginning of a church. And uh, so this letter that Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, he was writing it while he's in prison again in Rome for sharing the gospel. And, it, and it's roughly 10 years after he had started the church. And so as we begin this journey in the book of Philippians, I know that's a lot of introduction. But I want you to also know that one of the main mantras, one of the main themes of Paul in all of his writing is grace. And so he writes this letter uh, and he begins with the greeting. Uh, I can remember being in school learning to write letters and I can remember being a little boy and uh, they taught us that when we started a letter that we were to say dear so and so and then a comma. I can remember being a little boy uh, thinking how ridiculous it was to have to write dear uh, so and so to people that I didn't even know or to write it to another uh, boy or a man. Uh, I, I knew that the word dear was what my uh, father had called my mother, and I knew that was what my mother called my father. I thought that was the strangest, weirdest thing I'd ever uh, imagined, that I was going to greet somebody by calling them dear so-and-so. I can remember thinking that as a little boy. Um, I, I began to think to, uh, this week as I was preparing this sermon about different greetings. We have greetings of all types uh, in the English language. You know, when we pick up a telephone, most of the time we say hello. Uh, although I've heard some folks answer in kind of a unique and a strange way, hello is, is kind of the common one. Uh, when we see somebody we know that maybe it's a very informal setting, we may say hi. Uh, we may say, uh, we may ask questions. We may say, how are you doing? Uh, most of the time when that happens or when we ask that, we're not really so concerned with how they are doing. It's more of a greeting. And usually we say, fine, and how are you? Uh, we, we may, we even have cultural uh, uh, greetings that, that are different in one place than another. You know, they say down in Australia, they say, good day. And... Uh, but yet down south here in the United States, it may be howdy. Uh, we, we have all types of greetings, but most of the time they're just pleasantries. They're words that we use to just say hello. And uh, so Paul begins his letter as anyone would with a greeting. But I want you to know that this greeting it's not just a normal greeting. It's not just a hi. It's not just a how are you. It's not a howdy. It's not a how, how, uh, how you doing. It's not even dear Philippi. But it's rather what I've entitled this sermon, a greeting of grace. As I said, grace is a theme that we hear, a resounding theme over and over throughout the writings of Paul. And so as we begin in this, uh, we want to ask the question, what is grace? What does grace mean? Grace is unmerited favor. God's unmerited favor. That means it's not earned. You can't work to get it. It's not because of who you are. It's not based on status. It's not from where you're from or, or anything that you have. It's totally unmerited. As I have said so many times, it is when we get something good that we do not deserve. And so as Paul begins this letter to the Philippians, we're going to be looking at two simple verses today. As we see Paul share a greeting of grace. If you've got your Bibles you, and uh, I hope you do have them with you. You can turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2 today. And if you don't have a Bible handy and you're watching on the screen. You're going to see it pop up here. And this is what God's word says. Paul and Timothy. Servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for your holy word. And even in the, in, in the very utterance and the beginning of a greeting, of a letter, you've got a word for us today. You've got a message to us. Lord, you've shared with me. You have opened my, eye, my eyes to, to see the, uh, the grace that you pour out on us, not just at salvation, but continually. And so, Lord, as we look at these two verses today, I just pray, Lord, that you would remind us of your grace. If there's someone here watching that needs your grace, I pray that today they would surrender to your grace. And, Lord, we just thank you for that amazing grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's three things I want you to see today out of these verses. First thing I want you to see is that God's grace extended to the senders, the senders of this letter. Now, we typically say that Philippians was written by Paul, but in verse 1, he clearly says that it's Paul and Timothy. Now, we don't know uh, if Timothy actually had a lot to do with the content of it, or maybe he was just sort of a scribe. We know that as the book goes on, Paul uses the personal pronoun of I and me and my an awful lot in it, so... Um, it, it's more than likely that Timothy had more of a minor role in writing it. And like I say, maybe even just the scribe, the secretary that wrote down the words that, that Paul uh, was, was dictating to him. But the, it begins that Paul and Timothy are, and he says, servants of Christ Jesus. Um, you think about these two men where they had been and where they had come from. Paul had been born as, as a Jew, but he was, he was unique in that he was a Roman citizen. Paul was known by both a Hebrew name and a Greek name. His Hebrew name was Saul. When we begin to read about him in the early part of Acts, we see him being referenced by that Hebrew name of Saul. But later as he begins his missionary journeys and he's doing mission work out in different areas, he is then goes by the name Paul, his Greek name. Just a, just a reminder to us that sometimes while the, while the message must never bend, the, the truth of the gospel should never be compromised. The fact is we, as Paul said, have to become all things to all people so that we might win some. We can't set ourselves off as aloof, but rather we try to find common ground with those that are lost so that we have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. But Paul had been a Jewish Pharisee. In other words, he knew the law. He had been raised to know the law inside and out. And as a matter of fact, he had even helped to, to kill uh, the, the Christians. He had been opposed to Christianity in such a way that he was even present when Stephen, one of the first deacons, was stoned and he held the coats of the men who stoned him. But Jesus met with him on the Damascus road. And Jesus spoke to him. And Jesus, Jesus uh, struck him blind. And he revealed himself to Paul. And Paul became a believer in Jesus Christ. He didn't become a, a believer where he just uh, uh, went to the synagogue once in a while. He didn't become a believer where it was just kind of a, a side note to his uh, tent making uh, business. It wasn't that it was uh, something that he did on the side, but rather when he gave his life to Christ, he gave it all to Christ. And Christ became the very passion and the very heartbeat of Paul himself. Timothy. Timothy, a little different story. Timothy was already a believer when he met Paul in Lystra. We find that in Acts chapter 16 verse 1. But Paul had been to Lystra before and we don't know, maybe... Maybe Timothy had, had surrendered to Jesus under the preaching of Paul for all we know, but we don't know that. But we do know that he was already a believer, already a disciple based on Acts chapter 16 verse 1. We also know that his mother and grandmother were godly women who had shared the word with him from the time that he was an infant, the Bible says. 
But in both cases, both cases, the murder of Saul or the young boy Timothy, both of them had their encounters with Jesus because of the grace of God. It wasn't because of anything they had done to earn it. There wasn't anything they had done that, that made them deserving of God's grace. And so uh, right off the bat, they, they refer to themselves as sl- servants. If you go into other translations, you'll see the word slaves. We don't have anything quite like it. And so it's lost a little of its meaning in the, in the world that we live in now, in our culture. But this term was a bond servant or a bond slave. And this servant, this term uh, servant doesn't carry the weight that the original Greek did. This bond slave, they were in slavery because they had sold themselves into slavery. Usually because of financial problems. Maybe they had borrowed money and couldn't repay it. And so they had sold themselves into slavery. Now I want to tell you, we don't like to admit it. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we, we don't like to, we, we, we indulge and enjoy our freedoms. We don't like to maybe admit, but the fact of the matter is, as humans, we're enslaved to something. Something enslaves us by our own choosing. The Bible teaches that we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to Jesus Christ. We have have connected and locked ourselves in to serving. Either self-serving through sin or living for the glory of the Lord. But now, these two men, these bond slaves, they're now sharing grace that's what they're doing. That's what they had done at Philippi. That's how, that's how that they had, had uh, uh, shared the gospel, how they had planted that church in Philippi. Uh, one of the uh, authors that I was reading uh, in studying for this says this, Evangelism stirs up our passion for Jesus. It produces holiness and it yields hatred for sin. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if we want to see revival in our church, in our churches, in our land, then we need to be busy about winning lost souls for Christ. When lost people start getting saved, the people of God become passionate. They become stirred and a fire burns within us. Paul and Timothy had recognized the grace of God. And they never got over it. They were working for him. They were living for him. And so the first thing we see was God's grace to the senders of this letter. The ones who were sending this letter out to the church at Philippi. But we also, the second thing we see is that God's grace uh, extends to the recipients. Guys, that's not advancing for me. It'll pop up here in a second, but uh, God's grace to the recipients uh, is the second thing that we see. He calls them this. He says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. I, I find it funny that he's writing to the saints in Christ Jesus And yet he had to especially mention the overseers. That's the pastors. Some refer to them as bishops. Some refer to them as elders. The the church leadership and to the deacons. So when he says to all the saints, somehow or another it didn't seem to include the preachers and the deacons. Uh, I don't know what that says about preachers and deacons, but he specifically said, including you guys too. Not just the saints, but you guys included. But God's grace was evidence to the recipients. First off, he referred to their spiritual identity. He called them saints. 
He called them saints. Now, I want you to know, sometimes we think about the saints, we think about a football team in New Orleans. We think about uh, these dead people who have gone on that, that we uh, name things after. St. John, St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. James. And we could go on and on with all these saints, people that we, uh, somebody has decided that they, we bestow the honor of being a saint. Well, I want you to know I'm not a good person. That anything that's good in me is uh, out of Jesus Christ and out of Him alone. But you can refer to me as Saint Rich. I can refer to you, I hope, as Saint Whoever. What makes us a saint is not because we're a little holier than anybody else. It's not because we're a little more righteous than anybody else. It's not because we've done something greater or done something even for the good or for the poor, uh, uh, for the good of the poor, or for the, uh, even for the glory of the Lord. What makes us saints is the fact that we're no good in us and that we have surrendered ourselves to Jesus Christ and He is our good. He is our goodness. He is our righteousness. We're saints by grace, not by works. We're saints because of our connection to Jesus Christ. So, uh, they have grace uh, in their spiritual identity. They're connected. They're saints because... They're connected to Jesus. But also, he says, specifically to the saints that are in Philippi. Their physical locality is a picture of grace. Here's what I want to tell you out of this. Grow where you're planted. Grow where you're planted. Be, be the Jesus that somebody needs to see right where you are, right when you are. So many times we act like, you know, I would do more for the Lord if I had more money. If I had a better job, if I had a better house, I would invite people over and, and lead Bible studies in my home if I had a better place. I would, I would do more for the Lord if I had more money. I could, I could tithe then. I don't have enough money to tithe now, but if I had more money, I could do that. If I live somewhere else, uh, uh, not around all these people that are crazy and had better folks listen to me, then, then I would share Jesus a little bit better. Folks, I'm here to tell you, where you are when you're here is exactly where and when God puts you there. Our identity with Christ must be lived out in a specific place and in a specific time. And it's not for tomorrow or the next week or the next year or when you get finished with school or when you get married or when you have children. It's for the right here and the right now. We don't have to wait until we're on a mission trip before we go door to door telling people about Jesus. We don't have to wait till we're on some sort of ministry plan before we can begin to tell people about the love of Christ. We don't have to wait until we're finished with COVID-19 before we share what Jesus Christ has done to change our life. We're to grow right where we are. Young people, I, I tell you, I was a youth pastor, many of you know, for years and years. And uh, one thing that always frustrated me, and I would uh, try not to get too upset about it because I knew they meant well, but I've heard a lot of older folks say, well, they're the church of tomorrow. Tomorrow? They're not the church of tomorrow. If they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I don't care if that happens when they're five, six, seven, or eight years old. They're the church of right here, right now, today. Do they need to grow? Absolutely. Do they have a lot of things that, that need to take place in their lives? Absolutely. But so do I. So do you. The fact of the matter is, God doesn't want to wait till they're grown-ups to use them. He wants to use them right here, right now. And so I'm here to tell you, parents, grandparents, church family, don't, don't uh, be a wet blanket to the young people that are the church now. not Yeah, they're going to be the church tomorrow, but they're the church right now. They don't have to wait to share their message of what Jesus has done for them. Right here, right now, grow where you're planted. 
Not only did he talk about their spiritual identity and their physical locality, he talked about their vocational capacity. Now, he did speak. He said, now, including you overseers, you pastors, you, you staff members, and you deacons. The word deacon, of course, means that the one who is a servant to others. Now, I will tell you, maybe you're not a preacher or a pastor or a staff member or a deacon. Maybe that's not your role. But the Bible teaches us that as a Christian, you've got one. As the body of Christ, we all make up different parts and we all have different roles. And likewise, as a, as a uh, Christian, you are called to a work. This church that he was writing to was started by a wealthy Asian woman, a Roman guard, and a delivered slave girl. Do you think at any point in time that those people thought they would ever be used for the leadership in a church to start a church, a thriving church that Paul loved? The fact is God's not calling those who have ability He's, he's just calling those that have availability. He doesn't he didn't want you to be, uh, to be somehow uh, qualified. He'll qualify you. The fact of the matter is, God may use our past to minister to others, but in doing so, he'll not allow it to hinder us from his calling. And he'll use your past to minister to others. So we see God's grace to the senders. We see God's grace to the recipients. And the third thing I want to show you to, uh, this morning is God's ongoing grace. His continuing grace. You see, grace saved us. We sang earlier about amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. And while that is true, that grace has never left me. That grace has continued on in my life. The matter, as a matter of fact, that grace was holding me and, and protecting me before I ever accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you're lost... The only reason you're not already dead, the only reason you're not already facing eternal punishment is because God's grace, His mercy, he's, he, and His grace and mercy always go hand in hand. He's trying, to, he's trying to give you another opportunity. But if you're here today as a Christian, I'm telling you, His grace not only saves us, but it sustains us. It keeps us going. And one day His grace is going to glorify us when He takes us on to glory to be with Him. He says in verse 2, He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to think about peace. I've, I've made the joke so many times that you see these beauty pageants and these young ladies are asked what they would want if they had their heart's desire. And they'd say, oh, I'd like to see world peace. Well, I want to tell you, peace in this world's not going to happen. I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I'm not trying to douse water on their dreams and hopes. But the scriptures is clear that things are going to continue to get worse and worse. And we're seeing it. But the fact is, peace, when spoken of in the Bible, is not an external condition. It's an internal condition of the heart. You see, the fact is, in times when it's quiet, when there's no fussing going on, there's no arguing, there's no fighting, there's no war, there's no external conflict, in those times of deep quiet, maybe even aloneness, there are people that are tortured and tormented in their soul. And even though it's quiet and peaceful all around them, peace is the farthest thing from them. Yet, 
in times where there's external chaos, things are going crazy, there's wars and rumors of wars, people's fussing, people's fighting. Maybe it's like uh, uh, our house on a Monday morning when people's trying to feed the dog, can't find the matching sock, there's stuff that wasn't put in the dryer that should have been, and, and we're trying to get breakfast as we're going out. But you know, even in the midst of chaos and in chaotic times, there it can be an internal peace and an internal calm that only comes through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus, that's why the Bible tells us that it is a peace that passes understanding. It doesn't make logical sense to us. And this grace and this peace is granted by the triune God. He, he, here we see a picture of Jesus' deity. He said this peace comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Three Three words, the Lord, meaning the master. In these times in, Roman, in the Roman Empire, the proper greeting of the day was to say, Caesar is Lord. And yet Paul clearly says that Jesus is Lord. Jesus was his name that was given to his mother Mary. And Christ is his role as Messiah that was spoken of in the Old Testament. He makes no qualms about it. He is God in the flesh is what Paul is saying here. And through the Spirit is how that peace comes. And so today we see this in this greeting, just these two simple verses, this greeting of grace, that God's grace was going out to the senders and that God's grace uh, uh, was, was also there with the recipients and that God's grace is ongoing to us as believers and to the church. And so today, I want to remind you, God has shown grace to us. Whether you're watching and you're lost, or whether you're watching and you're saved, God has shown you grace. He's shown you grace. He's let you live another day. He's given you another opportunity. That's grace. You don't deserve that, but it's, your, it's unmerited favor. It's the gift of today, the gift of this moment. God has shown you this grace. He still wants to show you grace. He wants to continue to show you grace. If you're here and you're watching this today, or you're uh, watching this online, maybe there's never been a point in time in your life when you have given your heart and life to Jesus. You see, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved. That's the only way that you're going to ever be saved. You can't work. You can't earn it. You can't do anything to deserve it. But it's by grace that you're saved through faith, just believing in Him. It's really that simple. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you are the Son of God. And I want to give you my life. If you can do that today, if you pray that simple prayer, bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for me and I believe you're the Son of God. I'll give you my life. If you'll do that and pray that simple prayer and mean that in your heart, then I'm going to tell you, you're going to see grace as you've never seen. A saving grace. That amazing grace that will save you. He wants to show it to you today. For you Christians, I want to ask you this question. Are we greeting others with the grace that God has shown us? Paul didn't just say, hey, how you doing? Hello. It wasn't just a rubber stamp type of greeting. It wasn't dear church at Philippi. It was personal. As he said, it's God's grace that I am who I am. It's God's grace that you are who you are. And I'm praying that God continues to pour grace and peace out on you. Folks, I want to tell you, if you're a recipient of God's grace today, if you've received God's grace, then are you treating others, are you greeting others with the grace that God has shown you? I pray that you are. So many times I find that I get frustrated. I, I, I get upset. Maybe somebody hadn't, hadn't contacted me or somebody hadn't reached out to me. or, or some, Folks, I'm here to tell you, we've got to be loving on one another, showing grace to each other, holding ourselves accountable for showing grace to others. 
I pray that today you know and appreciate and love the grace that God has given you and the opportunity that he's given you to have even more of that grace and peace. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We love you for the grace that you've poured out on us, for the peace that you give us in our hearts. And we just pray, Lord, that you would take this simple sermon and that you would use it for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.